Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. When I went to try to beg other people, other Hold'em and Mennonites, because these are the people I'm around, but I was describing it to them and saying, you know, it would last for hours. He would literally be for hours. And people are trying to say, you know, oh, that's that's not true. I was even told it's not physically possible mm -hmm. for someone, a grown man, my dad, to be someone for hours. And I'm like, but it is, he takes breaks. <sighs> um, he put a deadbolt on my door. He had nailed the window shut, both the tops and the bottoms. Um, it was approved of among the Holdeman because I was considered unruly and bad and things like that were necessary because I refused to submit. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces, go to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like and subscribe, become one of the supporters of these amazing guests who are bravely coming on and telling their stories, and um, leave some words of encouragement for them in the comments. It's really, really helpful. So today's guest, I was connected to her through Eli. We've just done a couple episodes with Eli Yoder, who was ex-Amish in Old Order Amish, and we really wanted to get a female perspective. Now today's guest, she is not from the Amish, she is from the Holdeman Mennonites, but they, they have some similarities, but also distinct differences, which we're going to go over in a second. But she went through some really, really tough times, abuse that was perpetuated by the group, no one was really helping her, and we are going to go into her heart-wrenching story. So, viewers, be advised, this is a tough one to listen to. So, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Hannah Prosser. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely, and you also wrote a book about your story. So, guys, if after this you want to know more about Hannah's story, her book is called Beat, My Journey Through Abuse and the Holdeman Mennonites. I'm so happy that you were able to get your story down on paper. I know how difficult that is. I'm, I'm trying to write my own book right now, and it is just quite the undertaking. So congratulations on writing that down and publishing that. Thanks. That's great that you're writing yours. Yeah. Um, it, it was, yeah, writing, writing mine, it was so hard. Um, I went years, over a decade, without even talking about where I came from mm. or what happened because I just couldn't. I couldn't face it. I couldn't cope with it. I didn't know how to talk about it. And I went from that to writing my memoir, publishing it. And, you know, now I talk about it. Yeah, that's so amazing. I'm just so happy that you're being brave and willing to tell your story. I know it's really difficult. And so we just all appreciate you being willing to come on and talk about it. So part of Hannah's story is actually her family converting to the Holdeman Mennonites when she was eight years old. So she knew what life was kind of like before and after. So we're going to get into all of those changes. And I guess first, let's just talk about the differences that you're aware of, of the Mennonites and the Amish, or maybe the similarities to whatever you want to talk about. Okay. It is really hard to talk about um, the, how the Mennonites and Amish are different because there's so many different types of Amish groups and they're all different and so many different types of Mennonite groups and they're all different. Um, the people watching may have heard a lot about Amish in mainstream media. And I can mostly talk about the Holdem and Mennonites. For example, like they do have running water. They do have electricity. They do have cars. Um, and actually now they even have cell phones. <laughs> uh, they are, they have like a spyware app on them that the church made that monitors everything they do and blocks a lot of things, even like YouTube. Some of them have found ways around it though. So you'll still find some Holdemans online, but they're not supposed to be on things like YouTube. Like I bet there's probably going to be some in the comments at some point because they like to do that. 
welcome um, <laughs> welcome guys if you're right? watching <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there's probably gonna be some what i noticed at least as far as our conversations off camera is that the Amish and the Mennonites kind of appear, th their appearance is the same in the way that they dress. Is that true? Or what are the differences there? So with the Holdeman Mennonites, the females have to wear hand-sewn dresses. Um, now the men, they're allowed to wear store-bought clothes. Don't ask me how that works. It was just something you're not supposed to question. When I would question it, people would get very upset because you're just supposed to submissively obey. Mm -hmm. It's just the way things are. Okay, so for those who aren't familiar, it's the long dresses, right? Like up to your neck, to your wrist, down to your ankles, very modest. So for every day, we were allowed to wear short sleeves. Okay. The sleeve ended like at the elbow bend. And then to church, we had to wear long sleeves. Mm. You know, got to have long sleeves or else you go to hell. Also had to have black shoes to church. Um during the week, we wore one head covering on basically, I would describe it as a bun cover, mm -hmm. kind of. It was black. Um, they all had to be the same. And then to church, we had to wear two head coverings. Okay. So I used to ask if I was twice as sinful on Sundays, because if one head covering was good the rest of the time, then why did we have to add a second one, a tie down to church? Right. People didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, it seems like you were pushing back fairly young, which is, I was. is good, but then it, it came with some ramifications that were not good. Which right. I also, maybe we can start there. Let's talk about your life before your family converted so that we can get a sense of where you came from and then this strict kind of community that you were brought into. First, we lived in Tompkinsville, Kentucky, up until I was nine years old. Things were not great there. We were not what I would consider traditionally worldly. Um, we were homeschooled. Us kids were not allowed to have any friends. There were five of us kids. At the time later, another one would be born after we turned the night. The not being allowed to have friends part was so hard. There was a little boy that lived across the street and we used to sit on opposite sides of the street and yell back and forth at, at each other and try not to get caught. Aww. And my mm -hmm. and my mom would take us to the library down the street so we could see other kids even though we weren't even allowed to talk to them. Which really sucked. Yeah. <laughs> we went to a missionary Baptist church which was my grandpa's. It was super tiny. It was pretty much only family and a very small amount of us. Like my, my actual like family made up over half the church itself. Oh, wow. Do you know why your parents didn't want you to have friends? Were they trying to keep you isolated for religious reasons or did they ever explain to you why that was the case? So it was my dad um, that wanted it to be like that. But, of course, my mom wound up following along with it. Mm. Um, he, it was, it was always about the religion and it was about the control factor. He wanted us to be his little minions, his little robots, his property. Um, I was called property from a very young age. And, you know, I was, I was a female. So in his mind, I was his property and so was his wife, mm -hmm. um, my mom. <laughs> and he just, he took things so far and he actually wanted to join the Amish. Um, he started looking into it and he took us to a couple different Amish churches, but um, he was a doctor and he would not have been allowed to remain a doctor mm. if he went Amish. So he started looking at other places and he wound up finding the Holdeman Mennonites in the Muddy Pond, Monterey, Tennessee area. Okay. And so he wanted a community where he could exercise complete control over you and yes. your mom but not too strict because he still wanted to have certain amenities and, quote, worldly things. Yes, which the Holderman Mennonites, they only go up to grade eight and then they graduate. But with my dad coming in, 
they decided, you know, a doctor wasn't a bad thing and he'd gotten the education prior to knowing better. Mm -hmm. So they allowed it. Wow. Okay. So are you comfortable with speaking about how he was at home with you and your your brothers before you went into the, the Mennonites? So at that time, my brother was kind of what I would consider the it kid. Um, <clears throat> he was the one that was abused the most. You know, all of us were abused at, to a certain extent at that point. But for him, it was it was bad. Um, my older brother actually um, took it took a lot of it out on me mm. and my siblings as well, and he wound up molesting me and some of my other siblings as well. Um, but yeah, oh, I'm so sorry. And so then, when you moved into the Mennonite community. How did things change for you and your family? Well, firstly, when we moved, we left. Um, we left with like the clothes on our backs, couldn't even take our toys or anything. So we get to this community, which of course my dad had already scoped out. I had already been there numerous times. Um, and my dad kind of released us kids in a way. And he said, here, these are kids you can be friends with. Mm. And for the first time, I was put into school. Now, granted, it was the, you know, super tiny little church school. Um, there were a couple school rooms for the upper grades and the lower grades and one teacher per classroom. But I finally got to be around other kids. Yeah. So that was great. Um, my social skills were lacking because at how secluded we'd been before so and obviously as us coming from the world we weren't um i guess what they would consider you know true born mennonites and everything right. we were treated differently i stood out for many ways because the social things and whatnot and interacting with other kids of course i had my siblings but when you go and interact with different kids it, it's just it's different yeah. So we, of course, began, well, myself, my sister, and my mom began wearing these hand sewn dresses. And I began learning how to sew. My mom actually left for about two weeks, not long after we moved there and took us kids with her to stay at her parents for a little while. And it was, it was really heartbreaking when we had to come back. Mm -hmm. Because we were hoping that, okay, we were, me and my siblings were being told that we were going to start going to public school. And like my Nana went out and bought us school clothes and we were finally going to have freedom and get away from the abuse of my dad. And um, then she went back. It didn't last for long. Yeah. Wow. So in some ways, you actually had more freedom going into this restrictive community yes. than the outside world. Mm -hmm. How interesting. So what are the things that you noticed were more restrictive? No music. Now, mm. my my dad had back in, you know, Tompkinsville, he didn't like us listening to music anyways or watching TV, things like that, and would get very upset. But here in the Mennonites, you know, there's no TV to try to sneak to watch. There's no radio to try to sneak to listen to. And I, I really love music. I love it. And that was not fun. But for them, they sing all, all acapella. Um, even if you had something simple like a flute or a harmonica, you know, that, that's, that's going to send you to hell. So oh, wow. you can't have those. Oh, that must have been so difficult. I wonder how <laughs> that would be kind of hard to learn a song, I guess, without some sort of musical instrument to guide everybody. Yeah. I just think it's really interesting that producing music with your body is okay, but producing music with other things is not okay. Did they ever give you a reason as to why that was the case? You know, I never could get a real reason. I asked because I pointed out that even in the Bible that trumpets and harps are played in yeah. praise and people dance. Dancing was also forbidden, of course. Oh. And I'm like, so if they can do that in the Bible and it's okay, how is it not okay now? Why don't we allow it to? And still it came back to I was being unruly because I was questioning things and I just needed to accept it. Or, you know, they they just didn't have an answer and would, you know, just 
kind of look at me and give up. <laughs> um, they're just, there wasn't real answers because mm. the answer didn't exist. It's just the way things are. That's so hard to get around because there's just, like, you can't even push back on it if it's just because I said so. Like, it's, yeah. it's very thought stopping. It doesn't allow you to expand your mind and, and try and understand further. It's just complete obedience. Yeah. And that's something that's very common among many high control groups. And you said that you left your toys behind. Mm -hmm. Did they allow toys in the community? If so, what kind of toys were you allowed to play with? Um, they did allow toys. Uh, you couldn't have any toys that, of course, played music. So even those cute little battery-powered little kid pianos and stuff like that, I mean, you, you just couldn't have those. I'm trying to think. It was it was like baby dolls. I had a doll cradle. Um, I had one of those Fisher Price washer and dryers. You know those? I don't, I don't know if you can picture. It was it was it was actually fun, but <laughs> yeah, things like that. And then um, I had two ponies. I know that's not like toys. But I was obsessed with my ponies um, and, yeah, played in the woods a lot. Okay. A lot. So I, it's interesting. I'm trying to kind of draw the parallels from what I know about the Amish to the Mennonite community. Mm -hmm. And some of the rules are the same, but I'm imagining because you're allowed to have cars, do you have work courses or... Are you allowed to have tractors and things that plow the fields? They can have tractors. Um, actually, there is a sorghum mill in the community where I came from that they used Belgian ponies to mill some of the sorghum. But you could absolutely have machinery. In a weird way, it's kind of like if um, the world, per se, and the Amish had a baby, that's the Hold'em and the Knights. <laughs> that's just kind of how I feel about it. It's just, it's a mix, you know? Yeah. They can have some of the modern things, but not all of them. And the men can wear store-bought clothes and the women have to wear hand-sewn clothes. It's very strange. Yeah. I'm just, it's funny. I'm trying to picture everything. <laughs> so then what did you do with your time? So I guess I'm trying to figure out, are you able to have jobs outside of the community or is everything still pretty isolated within itself? The men, one of the common jobs was being a carpenter. And of course, there wasn't enough carpentry work within their own communities. So they would go outside and they would work on really fancy houses. Of course, people would pay them a lot. And a lot of people confused them with Amish. So mm -hmm. some people would seem to think they were hiring Amish workers, but they're hiring Mennonites. Okay. And what about the women? So the women, if they work, it would typically be like in one of the community general stores or the community bakery, uh, things down that line. Okay. But usually it's pretty much, you know, you stay home, you're, you're supposed to be this very submissive, submissive wife, you clean all the time, you raise babies, that's your job, that's your life. Mm -hmm. That's a great majority. And also women can teach too. I forgot mm. to say that. So they got, you know, these eighth grade educated women being the teachers for these, you know, up to eighth grade gra graduating students. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, what was the education like? Did you feel like you learned quite a bit about the outside world or was it focused more on religion? It was a mix. So, of course, we had religion, but we also had math. Um, we did have science. I am positive that the science we learned there is definitely not the same as in public schools. Mm -hmm. I have two daughters in school right now, and it's, it's definitely different. All right. So now that we kind of have a basic understanding of what life was like in the Holdsman Mennonite community, I want to get more into your story personally. So when you first got there, uh, you mentioned to me previously that your brother, your oldest brother, actually stayed outside with your grandparents, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. So when you moved in, you felt like the attention that your brother was getting, the, the wrong kind of attention kind of fell to you. Are you comfortable talking about that at all? Yeah, we can talk about it a little bit. Okay. I don't want to dive too deep into it. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, this is 
a positive feel good experience kind of for me. And I don't want to, I don't want to get dragged down into all the awfulness, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> Whatever you're comfortable with um, talking about so that we can get an idea of what your life was like and how that was perpetuated by the community. Of course, I think we already kind of established. I was the one that asked way too many questions. I pointed out inconsistencies. Um, and my dad just wanted these blind, submissive little robots. And he did not like that I asked so many questions. And he, he tried to break me on purpose. He told me he was going to break me like a horse. He would lunge me. I don't, I don't, for horse people, y'all are going to know what I mean. <laughs> um, basically lunge me in circles. Um, while beating me, he would beat me up to hours at a time, but he took breaks. And when I went to try to beg other people, other Hold'em and Mennonites, because these are the people I'm around, um, I was cut off from, you know, all the, like my grandparents and people I'd known before, like all that was cut off. When I would go to try to tell people and explain what he was doing, at first I wasn't using the word beat. I didn't understand that what was happening was considered being beat, even though it was leaving bruises. Um, it would, you know, leave cuts and stuff on me. But so I was using this word whipped, but I was describing it to them and saying, you know, it would last for hours. He would literally be for hours. And people are trying to say, you know, oh, that's, that's not true. I was even told it's not physically possible mm -hmm. for someone, a grown man, my dad, to be someone for hours. And I'm like, but it is, he takes breaks. Because he would, he would um, stop at some point. He would be, you know, rolling with sweat. I'd be miserable in so much pain, rolling in sweat. And he'd make me lay on the floor and hold his hand. And a lot of times he would go get a parenting book because he was all into all these parenting, you know, how to be your kid books, mm -hmm. essentially. I don't like, it's not a discipline book. It's a, it's, they're horrible, horrible books. He would like hold it up above him and read while he's, you know, making me hold his hand. And, um, then he would start again and it was horrible. People would not listen. And some people, some people would think that I was just over exaggerating it a little bit. And they would believe that, you know, th that I was being very severely disciplined, you know. But that I deserved it because I mm. always ask questions. I didn't just accept, you know, that I, w that I was being given, say, like an eighth grade education. That was a really big thing. That was a huge reason for so many beings. Um, because I just kept demanding that I wanted, I wanted a high school education, a proper full education. Um, and I eventually knew that I wanted to go to college. You know, I had aspirations. I'm like, you know, their religion isn't my religion. Why do mm -hmm. I have to follow your religion? Like, this is, this is my life. And he was just, he was just terribly, terribly cruel. And the primary focus was on me. And of course, my siblings, well, I guess I became such an easy target because, you know, how I was, I wasn't submissive enough. Whereas my siblings, they submitted, they, well, at least, you know, my sister submitted. My brothers, they were being brought up, on the other hand, to believe that they were second to God. And mm -hmm. they were, you know, far above women and everything. But everybody was falling into their roles just as they were supposed to, except right. me. And then when um, I was 13, he started doing other things. Um, he told me I was a grown woman. And he started raping me. Oh. And, um, I didn't know even, I didn't know that word. Um, I had been, you know, so sheltered and everything. I had no idea what that word was. I didn't know exactly what he was doing. And even though, you know, it was, 
it was kind of what my brother had done, you know, years before, but this was completely different. It was so violent before. But I did later find out what it all was from dictionaries and encyclopedias, books at the library, things like that. Um, my mom used to take my sister and I to the library and she wasn't supposed to, um, because, you know, we could learn too many things there and she would, she would take us and then we would go get groceries and then we'd hide the library books in grocery bags mm. to sneak them inside the house. So I learned a lot through the library. Wow. Did you ever tell your mom what was happening? Did she know? I did try to tell her. I tried to, since I didn't have all the proper words, I was trying to describe it. And she's like, no, absolutely not. You know, you're lying. That That's not a thing. Um, <sighs> later, I did tell the elder minister and another woman at a different congregation. She was also holding a Mennonite. She was at the Murray, Kentucky congregation. And um, I knew her daughter. We'd met when like they came up for a wedding or something. And um, nothing came of it. But yeah, my, my memoir goes over things in a lot of detail. I just, I, I just don't want to, you know, go too far into it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Were you given any type of sex education to understand your own anatomy or what sex was or how babies were made? Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Not at all. No, I, I learned that from books. Mm. And... Yeah. And then, of course, once I learned, you know, what sex was and all that, then I had to figure out and differentiate that from the other word. Because right. um, obviously those are two very different things. Right. Oh, I just have to say I'm so sorry that all of this happened to you. And I know that, you know, it was wrong and it's not your fault. I think just sometimes it's nice to hear it from somebody else that this never should have happened to you. It should never happen to anyone, any child. Yeah. It's just, it's so heartbreaking that it, from my perspective, it feels like the only reason your father moved you into that community is because he mm -hmm. would have easier access and no one would question him and no one would believe you and yeah. it would just make the abuse a lot more accessible yeah that's exactly what it is yeah wow were you aware of any abuse going on outside of your family within the community you know i i wasn't able to recognize it at the time and of course it take, took years of learning you know definitions of like the word B and such yeah but there was there were other schoolmates that were absolutely being beat. And then, of course, there's the mental and the psychological factor, which, of course, they claim isn't abuse. But obviously, they're just screwing with people's heads over there. All the rules and everything that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. So is it common then to use corporal punishment as a way to make your kids submissive? Yes. Yes. You know, one thing I could never understand was how my pain and the horror I was going through and my life, my daily life of all, everything I was having to endure, why none of that mattered. But only my death mattered because it's all about, you know, my soul. And they believe that it's completely okay to break somebody, especially a child, just to save their soul. That just tells me life doesn't matter, only death does. And that just isn't, isn't how it should be <laughs> at all, ever. Right. Would you be able to go into the extremity, like how intense this corporal punishment was? And you don't have to use your own example, but even just the community's rules and standards for how you make a child submissive. Because I... I want to make the distinction that it's not just like a spanking here or there, mm -hmm. uh, which I still am not for, but that it was really heavily abusive things. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. One of the school board members, he had a daughter. She was in the grade younger than me. And 
she had gotten a, a beating for something. I don't remember what it was, but we were over at their house and it was maybe the next day after it had happened. And the girl couldn't hardly sit down. Like mm. she was in so much pain. And I remember hearing her dad talking about, you know, how he'd made sure to discipline her properly and that he made sure when he disciplined her and she had other siblings as well, that whatever it was they would had done would not happen again. Um, they, they absolutely, they literally believe in just breaking someone emotionally, not bones, but being someone until they would never dare do something or ask something or think something again. Wow. What were some of the common things that people would be punished for aside from the obvious, like acting out or talking back? Was there like what what are the levels of something so small that you could do and be punished for? Okay. Like with my dad, he he um, wanted my mom to walk very slightly behind him, like to a side, like a step or a half step behind him. And then all the siblings were supposed to all follow slightly to the side and behind her and him, like little ducks in a row. Yeah. Um, and that would be to show his authority and show that he is the head of household. He is the one in control. We are behind him. We belong to him. We're his property. Yeah. So not doing something like that, refusing to do something like that, which I re absolutely refuse to many, many times because I I just, I wasn't property. <laughs> like mm -hmm. why? I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and he would, you know, beat me horribly for things like that. So, and that's just a tiny thing. I mean, I, I just... It, why would you make kids walk behind you always? And they're always supposed to be in your specific little spot. That has, that has to do with controlling someone physically and mentally. Yeah. It's not being a nice, loving family. Mm -hmm. I would never do that with my kids. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm sure you just felt like you were living on eggshells because you never knew mm -hmm. something that would cause you to be punished um, yeah. unless you were deliberately asking a question, which again is so damaging to not allow children to have exploration of thought and curiosity mm -hmm. and wonderment about the world. Yep. And it's absolutely okay. Even if you're not a kid. Yeah. It's okay to ask questions. So I know you had some things that you wanted to talk about as far as the community itself. Do you want to go into any of that? I know you shared a journal entry with me um, before we get into how you were able to escape. Yeah. One thing I think people would find really strange is in the Hold of the Mennonites, there's no dating or courtship. Like it's 100% forbidden. And that actually could be a Amish comparison because even in the Amish, um, as far as I know, all the groups that I know of allow these courtship, some form of it, mm -hmm. but the Holomans don't. And it's also not an arranged marriage. It's kind of like, it's really strange. So a guy, well, let me say firstly, the Holomans love to travel because of course they can only marry among their own. So um, especially once kids become age 15, then they'll start traveling, traveling around to other congregations and the guys are going to see the girls and the girls are going to be seen. So when a guy sees a girl that he likes, he has to send his proposal through the ministers. Now, granted, this is after um, he may or may not have had said hi to her. He may have sat near her during like a Sunday lunch somewhere. Um, he just may know basically hardly anything about her, mm -hmm. but he can send a proposal and it's taken by the minister to the girl's parents and then to the girl. And then of course she has the opportunity to say yes or no. Used to back when I was there. 
um, the girl was not allowed to say no, because mm. if you said no, then you weren't going to get another opportunity. Like, because by the time it, the proposal makes it all the way to the girl, it's basically the marriage has been, you know, um, accepted by God. This is what's supposed wow. to happen. So you're just supposed to say yes. I have heard now. So actually a positive change that girls can say no without that consequence of never getting another proposal. Mm -hmm. So that is good. But still, it's really weird. Can you imagine not dating someone or even having a private conversation with them? Yeah. Yeah. And the holy kiss. Okay. So this is really gross. The Holdeman Mennonites do this kiss a piece, which some groups do. But as far as I know, the Holdeman Mennonites are the only group that does it on the lips among everybody, children included, which means that a child as young as nine could be kissing a 70, 80, 90, whatever, how old Mm. person, you know, or... And I think it's really gross, especially for all the pedophiles that are in there. They get to, yeah. you know, kiss all these little boys on the lips. And it's disgusting. Um, for me, my experience with it was when I officially joined this church. Um, the first time it was, it, it was a lot of people because it was all the women and other girls that were members in the congregation. And they all lined up one by one and came and kissed me on the lips. And I will just never forget because some of their lips were dry. Some of them were wet. Like some of them were kind of cracked. I could taste their gum, their mints, their bad breath. It's gross. Yeah. And some people try to compare it and say, oh, we're like the Italians or the French do it. And I'm like, Okay, but are some of the people there even kissing complete strangers? Because even, you know, again, I mentioned before, Holden and Mennonites love to travel, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if people from Canada came over or people from other congregations or we went to other congregations, I was having to kiss those strangers. And I feel like it's, it's so gross. You know, of course, we didn't have sex education of course, didn't know anything about, you know, STDs and all that stuff. Um, but it's just, it's really gross. But it's one of those things you have to do in order to get to get to heaven. Um, oh, the Holden and Mennonite, yeah. They also believe that they are the one true church. Mm-hmm. And so only them are going to heaven. Just so you know, like, <laughs> it's just of them. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Says everybody ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but simple things like, you know, refusing to participate in this holiest kiss um, would, you know, could get you expelled and sent to hell over, you know? So it's kind of like you can't say no, right? You have to join because otherwise you're going to go to hell Mm -hmm. is what you're being told. And then you have to do all these things, whether, you know, it's, for me, wear the handsome clothes and two head coverings on Sunday and you got to wear black shoes to church because, you know, I guess God only likes black shoes. I don't know. I could never get a good reason for that either. I'm like, why can't I wear white shoes? Yeah. But it, it's just, you know, getting back to the holy kiss part, it's just very manipulative to be like, these are all the things that you have to do, even as a kid, in order to go to heaven When they don't even make logical sense. I mean, come on. When would the kiss happen? Was it at church? Like, how how did, was it a greeting? I'm trying to figure out where, when, and why this all happened. Okay. So, it's considered a greeting. Okay. It would be combined generally with a handshake while you are kissing the other person. Okay. Um, So, that's why you would even wind up greeting complete strangers. And I I did as well. Um, Had to kiss people that I did not know. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was male to male and female to female. I should point that out. Mm, Okay. But yeah, but it's, I think it's really gross. But if someone came over to your house that, you know, is another Holdeman, regardless of whether you know them or not, you would shake their hand and give them this kiss. 
Okay. So, and at church, when you see them, um, at baptism, you get the big line. So for me, I had to kiss approximately, give or take 200 ish people from a best estimate. Yeah. So that's a lot of people. That's, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't even like giving hugs as a kid. I would be so uncomfortable. Mm-mm. I can't imagine even, you know, like my kids. If if someone came up to them and kissed them, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if it's female or female. Like, mm-mm, no, that absolutely not. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, not no. to mention the germs of it all. Like just passing yeah. germs back and forth, especially mm-hmm. to kids. Well, even kids to adults. Like they're the ones that have all the germs, right? <laughs> yeah. they, they tend to get sick more than adults. So I just feel like, hmm, that's just not sanitary. <laughs> yeah. It's really gross. Is there anything else on your list that you wanted to talk about? Oh, the shunning. They also have shunning, mm. um, which I know uh, most or all, I'm not entirely sure, Amish groups also have shunning. Now, the Hold of the Mennonites call it the avoidance. And they're still allowed to talk to you, but it's only if it's about you coming back to the church. That's what they're supposed to have conversations okay. with you about. And they will still invite you to things like I'm, I'm shunned, <laughs> but mm. they will try to invite you to things, but at pretty much anything that they're doing, there's always food. And as a shunned person, you have to sit at a separate table because your sin will contaminate their food, which is so weird, what? but it's very, it's very shameful. Yes. Yeah. Can you imagine if you went to a family member's house and they invited you there, like they invited you for dinner and you go in and everybody sits at one big table or a couple big tables pushed together. And then you have a small, you know, card table or something like that over to the side and away from everybody. And you have to eat by yourself. Um, it's, it's in order to shame people so they come back to the one true church and get on the, the one true path, right. which is ridiculous. <laughs> Does this happen within the community or is it only if you leave? It's if you leave or if they choose to expel you because you're doing things they don't approve of. If you get a vehicle that you're not allowed to, you know, because even though they're allowed vehicles, you can't you know, have bright red and things like that. Um, if you are drinking alcohol or smoking tobacco, I'm trying to think of all the reasons you can get expelled for. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot. You can get expelled for so much. You know, if you are showing up to church and you're not dressed in what is essentially your uniform, especially mm-hmm. as a female, tons of reasons. <laughs> but yeah, they would they would expel you and then shun you. So in order to go back, you would have to come up with a repentance story and go tell it in front of the congregation. And then they would take a vote on whether or not they believed you. And then if they do, (laughs) they can vote you back in to their church. And then you wouldn't be shunned anymore. But of course, for me, I, I'm not going back. (laughs) Like that's, that's not a thing at all. I've, been gone for a very long time and it's a horrible place to be yeah i think one little funny side note that you mentioned off camera please explain to everyone why you can't have an suv oh because it's a sports utility vehicle and they don't believe in sports but they're really (laughs) fun yeah (laughs) but the funniest part is that like they let the kids and the youth play softball games and volleyball so it doesn't even make sense of course it's done either at the church or at another church member's house but so it's not like it's out like you're not allowed to go play sports at a park because that would be bad that would be forbidden i i guess that'd probably be a repentance thing so no other sports were allowed just softball and volleyball Mm -hmm. You couldn't play baseball. Baseball was bad. I don't know why. (laughs) I'm I'm not sure. Baseball was too sportsy. Uh Although, as like as far as I know, the only difference between baseball and softball is the ball is bigger. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. And softball, I I don't, I don't get it. 
I'm wondering about your mental state as you go into your teen years, 13, 14, 15. Are you still feeling rebellious at heart? Do you feel like you really believe the doctrine and you're trying to be good, but it's just too hard? What's going through your mind at that time? I wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. Okay. Um, I wanted to get out. I was just, you know, waiting till I turned 18 because there was nothing I could do um, before that, I believed. And I was, I was just stuck there. The, you know, obviously at this point, I noticed there's all these inconsistencies in things that they're telling me. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted nothing, nothing to do with it. Yeah. So I, I would love it if you could talk about how you escaped. Are you willing to talk about your life before that happened or the events leading up to that? Yeah. Okay. So when I was about 15, my dad started locking me in my bedroom and he had nailed the window shut, both the tops and the bottoms. Um, he put a deadbolt on my door and I, at first it was just at nighttime and then it slowly became, you know, here and there during the day for a few hours. But even when it was just at night, you know, I, I was not mentally okay. I was going through all this abuse, you yeah. know, the, all the beatings and the assault and just the mental and emotional. Um, I was also struggling with anorexia. Mm. I wasn't sleeping well. So I'd be a lot up a lot of the night and I would be locked in from early evening till, you know, mid late morning. So I would have to even just overnight because the Mennonites were all about, Oh, well, it's just overnight. Cause the Holdeman knew, um, I would have to go to the bathroom and so I would pee in cups or if I didn't have a cup in there, then I would wad up a dress and use the bathroom on it. And my sister would make fun of how my room would smell like pee sometimes. Mm -hmm. But as time went on, eventually it did become all the time that I was locked in. And that was, it felt like it felt like years of my life. It felt like so long, but it wasn't, um, it would have been months and they would s still let me out once every morning, once every evening to go use the proper bathroom. And then I would be locked back in and I would be what I call under guard. When I would be let out, um, it would either be my dad, one of my brothers or my mom. And, um, it would, you know, wouldn't be for long, pretty much just go to the bathroom and such. And then my mom would bring me food and water and whatnot. At one point, I had a sand bucket for the last little while of it that I had for my bathroom. And so when I'd be let out, I would carry that, you know, and go clean it out and everything and take it back. So that was not, and it was, it was super tiny. It was, it was like, one of the super tiny little dollar store sand buckets. So it was like, you know, little. Oh my gosh. And you said this was for months at a time that they would lock you in there? It was the last few months I was there. And the time frame, I don't know exactly. I don't know precisely if it was four months, if it was six months. Um, I, I would love, I feel like I should be able to pinpoint that, but I can't. It felt like forever. It wasn't. But. I, yeah, I was locked in there and my dad told me he was going to keep me in that room until I was 25 years old. Oh. And he said it was because I wouldn't be a woman until I was 25, but that directly contradicted what he told me at 13 because right. he said that I was a woman, but now he says, I'm not going to be a woman until I was 25. And no, that wasn't a Holdeman Mennonite, like grown age. Most females and whatnot were married by 20 or sooner. Mm. So people knew that this was happening, but they just allowed it yes. because they thought you were just being punished for something you had done wrong. Yes. So, of course, where it had started out a couple years or a year and a half or so before I was 
started being locked in all the time. There was plenty of time to talk to people about it and tell people about it. Um, it was approved of among the Holdeman because I was considered unruly and bad and things like that were necessary because I refused to submit. So, um, my dad used to have hours long conversations with the deacon as well on how to discipline me more and how to wear me down. But some of the conversations I heard sometimes and, um, I believe it was the deacon that came up with the idea. It was either him or the school board member that came up with the idea um, to change tool, like beating tools up because it was thought that I must grow too used to what was being used if one thing was used for too long. Oh my gosh. So there was a paddle that the deacon made. There was a leather strap that came from the local leather shop. And um, then he would have a stick, sometimes a couple different sticks because one that would be really super thick or one that was super thin, you know, because all of those things are going to give different feelings. Um, so when he would go in to beat me in these beating sessions, uh, he would pick one, he would bring all of them Usually he would do it in my room. Um, so he'd bring all of them and then he would start swinging one and then he, he would eventually change to another and then change to another and change to another. And I laughed in his face at one point and told him that, you know, he was wrong, that it didn't make it hurt worse, but he was actually right. It, it, it made it way worse. Mm -hmm. It made it so much worse. Wow. I'm so sorry. That is wrong on so many levels and you never should have had to experience that. Yeah. I think to bring this back up to a lighter note, a more victorious note, I would love it if you could talk about how you escaped. Yeah. Sorry. I was trying no. to get to that and I went backwards. That's okay. Okay. All right. So how I escaped. Um, one evening, it was in early April of 2006, I was 17 years old, and I was eight months away from turning 18. My mom let me out of my room to shower, and she said it was fine. And so I went in, I showered, cleaned up my bucket and all that stuff. When I came out, usually there's someone waiting there guarding me, you know, making sure I don't run, and nobody was there. So I peeked around the corner into the living room and I could see um, on the side table by my mom's chair was my dad's business cell phone. And at the time you had to be approved by the church to even have one of these cell phones. So he'd gotten approved for it because he was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I went and grabbed it. And in my dress, there was a elastic band that goes around the waist. And so I dropped it down the front of my dress because I didn't have pockets and I just like hoped that the elastic would hold it. Right. Mm -hmm. And my mom walked around the corner from the kitchen and took me back to my room, dead bolted me back in. And I waited hours before I finally got up the nerve. Um, it was around one o'clock in the morning and I in one of um, my chicken soup for the soul books, because my mom still brought me books and stuff, there was hotline numbers. And I called one of them and um, through talking to them, you know, pretty much made it clear that I wanted to die. And my, men my mental state was very poor, obviously, at yeah. this point. You know, here I was like, I'm trapped. No one's going to come help me. No one's coming for me. Um, the Mennonites are approving of this, you know, mm -hmm. all this stuff that's going on. No one's coming for me. And I, I needed to die to make it all stop. Three police officers and two EMT showed up and they were banging on the front door. And of course it woke my parents up and I could hear complete chaos. 
the people at the door were screaming. My parents were screaming. They were wanting to know where the girl was. Yeah. So um, they said, you know, well, like pointed, told them how to get to my room. And then they were, all these men were at my door, only they couldn't get in because it was dead bolted. Mm. I could hear them screaming for the key. And I was really scared at this point because I was like, you know, he's going to make sure I never have another chance to get a phone. He's going to kill me, you know, like, or I'm going to live here forever. He's not even going to let me go at 25. There was so much. I was so afraid. And then he got the key and I don't know which one unlocked the door. I actually know, well, since this, I found out all three of the cops names and stuff because I went looking for, um, all the documents that still existed not long ago. But um, they wound up taking me to the hospital. And of course, my dad was trying not to let them, telling them that he was a doctor and that mm-hmm. he was going to take care of me and um, that I was, you know, not mentally well and all this stuff, which technically at the point was kind of true. I was, I was a hot mess right. because of all the things he had done to me. I was not okay. Absolutely not. They took me to the hospital and later after that, I was put in foster care and I did age out of foster care. I did get my GED while I was in foster care um, and went to my very first movie theater when I was in foster care. Mm. So that was great. The state or children's services, of course, wound up trying to take my dad to court over some of the things and some of it was thrown out because they, for one, they didn't investigate properly. For another, I was not able to talk very much. Um, and because I was, I was at a point I was so traumatized and I was so relieved, you know, I was out, I was safe. I didn't want to look back. I didn't want to think about it. I wanted to think about the future. And I, I just, I literally could not talk very much. And my siblings, they, of course, my siblings were witnesses to a lot of things that had happened. And actually, they, I hadn't mentioned before, they um, had been encouraged to, like, laugh and watch and everything through a lot of my abuse. So, they, oh they saw a lot of it. Yeah. But my older sister was never questioned. And my, a couple brothers that were, they just asked them very basic questions and, a lot more could have been done, but I, at that point in time, I was not able to push for it. Um, and of course there wasn't enough physical proof or anything at that point, um, to prove things. And yeah, it's a long story. Like I write about all that in, in detail in my memoir, but yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I got out. I mean, I can't even imagine the relief he must have felt, but also how terrified to go into this big, crazy world, not knowing anybody, having gone Mm -hmm. through what you just went through. I don't know how you were even able to function. That must have been so debilitating to be in that position and also trying to go through the legalities of things with your dad. So he was never convicted of anything. He was never convicted, no. Oh. And do you, or were you worried about your siblings who were still in at that point? I was. Uh, My siblings had originally been taken and put in foster care briefly, but then they did wind up taking the kids back. (sighs) So, yeah. But you're right. Like coming, coming out was so hard. Um, And even trying to, again, you know, my social skills had been, I had had really poor early on social skills. And then I got basically Mennonite socialized, mm-hmm. right? And so now I'm out here in the great big real, real world. <laughs> and things, socializing and the way people talk, it's different out here. Yeah. And so it was, it was hard. And my foster siblings... Um, cause my, my foster parents had other teenage girls as well. And they, at first they found me a novelty, 
like they had to teach me like mascara and eyeliner and all this stuff. And like before I thought that like makeup, like all of it was just called makeup. I mean, it is, but we got all the, all these individual names. Yeah. (laughs) They're called a lot of different things. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but they got to teach me all about things and then they thought it was really funny that I didn't know what a genre was. So that was that apparently that's a really big deal when you're a teenage girl to know what a genre is because <laughs> that's important if someone's like, what kind of music do you like? Yeah. Or what genre do you like? What genre of movie? I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, they introduced me to lots of different types of music. Um, and, oh, and painting my nails. My foster mom got me a whole bunch of nail polish and I would change the nail polish multiple times a day Aww. because it was, it was so neat that I, I could, I could put color on my nails. Um, I went and got my hair cut and had highlights put in my hair and it was, and then of course I got to wear pants. <laughs> it was, it was a lot. It was yeah. a lot socially extremely hard but all the the new things was so fun yeah you said that you loved music what was your favorite kind of music once you were exposed to different types i listened mostly to country yeah for a long time now i'm more of like a pop light rock with a little bit of country but yeah oh that's awesome (laughs) Wow. So how are you doing now? Like, where are you at? I know you said you have two wonderful children. How are you Mm -hmm. doing? What's your consciousness? What makes you happy and at peace? Like, of course, I I have because of everything I went through, I have really terrible PTSD. Um, So some days, even most days can be really hard. It, It would I don't know that it's possible for a day to go by without, you know, being emotionally triggered or reminded of something um, mm-hmm. at some point during a day. But, you know, I I do have two amazing daughters. I've got three dogs. They are super cute. Aww. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a hobby where I do things with leather. I make leather purses and such. Wow. Um, yeah. And then I talk about what happened here and there, like on TikTok and such, um, and talk to friends as needed. It's been incredibly helpful since I got to the point after so long where I could finally talk about it just to talk. So I, I use that a lot, just kind of as a coping, a way of coping. Mm-hmm. Wow. Do you sell your purses? I don't. No. Oh, you should. <laughs> I'm sure people, people would be interested that. in buying them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Well, thank you so much for coming on and telling your story. I'm sure it was extremely difficult to relive some of those things. And I just commend you for being willing to come on and talk about it. And I hope you give yourself a lot of self-care today and know that what you did was really brave and is going to help a lot of people. Yeah, I hope it helps other people feel less alone, you know, because I know before I even started talking about it, hearing other people tell their stories, I'm like, of course I'm not the only one. <laughs> like there's so many people and there's so many people that even, you know, know what the daily struggle after the fact is, you know? Yeah. And I, it helps me feel less alone. And I hope that me talking about mine, it helps others, even if they are someone that isn't able to come forward and tell their story, if they're not at that point, or yeah. even if they're never at that point, I just hope hearing others it helps them feel less alone. Yeah, I hope so yeah. too. And I think I yeah. think it will be helpful. So thank you again. If people want to listen to you on TikTok, what is your TikTok handle? It's at Hannah Prosser underscore beat. Okay. And we'll definitely put the link in the description. We'll put a link to your book. Okay. And if you decide to sell your purses, you have to let me know and I will totally promote <laughs> okay. it for you so people can support okay. you. And before we go, though, I need your Linda Listen moment, your sassy statement to someone who's pissed you off or inspiration. <laughs> okay. So 
Wait, am I supposed to actually say Linda Listen? Yeah, say Linda Listen. All right, Linda Listen. So all these Holdeman Mennonites out there kissing kids on the lips, it is not okay. I agree. That's a great Linda Listen. I support that 100%. Stop kissing kids (laughs) on the mouth. Yeah, it's gross. Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. Well, do you have anything else that you want to add? Any final thoughts before we go? I don't think so. Okay. Well, thank you again. You've been incredible. And I really appreciate you. I can't say that enough. And to everyone else who is watching and listening, please leave some words of encouragement for Hannah in the comments. It helps her. It helps me. It helps the algorithm. It helps everybody. And hit that like button as well. If you want to support over on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. And my newest patrons, Traker and Brenda, thank you so much for your support. And guys, if you like this episode, I will leave two right here that you may want to check out as well. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. <laughs>